This is Bob Rourke with Business Leaders Podcast, and today we have Brad Cooper. Brad's the CEO of U.S. Corporate Wellness and the co-founder of the Catalyst Coaching Institute. And we've been trying to get this done for some time. So, <laughs> you know, Thank between you, you working on, you know, presenting in Germany, working on your PhD, I appreciate you taking time. It's, it's a joy to be here. Thank you very much. Super. And, you know, for you, uh, tell us about the business and who you serve. So two hats, U.S. Corporate Wellness, we serve employers. So employers that are looking to improve the lives of their employees in the health and wellness arena. But health and wellness is not, a lot of people think of it as food and fitness. We go so far beyond that. So we may be talking to them about stress or life balance or could be food, could be fitness, could be sleep, any number of things. And so that hat, we're in the trenches, we're with the employer, we're putting all those things together for them. And then the other hat We've been training wellness coaches. The wellness coaching industry has changed dramatically in the last really two years. In fact, almost to the day, two years, uh, there's now a national board certification for wellness coaches. So you can't just, you know, you and I can't be just having a cup of coffee and say, hey, you want to be a wellness coach? You say, yeah, Brad, that sounds pretty good. And we walk out the door wellness coaches. There's now an extensive training process. You have to go through an accredited program. You have to have a number of practice sessions, et cetera. And so we're one of the programs that if you decide you want to be a health and wellness coach, you could go through our program, become certified, and pursue that national board exam. So on one hand, we serve the employers. On the other hand, we serve the people out there doing it. Sometimes there's an overlap. Uh, we're known in the industry as the, basically the coaching experts. So the companies that really want top-level coaching, they come to us. And sometimes that's because they heard of us through the Catalyst Coaching Institute, and they didn't even know about U.S. Corporate Wellness. You know, for, for, for the business owner that maybe hasn't really gone down the road of approaching this as a strategy for the company, what's the typical problem that that business owner will recognize or, or into it in his company, and why do they typically reach out to you? A lot of answers to that. It's a wonderful question. First off, they tend to look at their medical claims and say, oh, man, are you kidding me? We're going up another 8%, another 12%, whatever this year. We have to do something about that. And that doesn't happen like this. You've got to get a good plan in place. And so oftentimes that's the first thing that makes them reach out or have one of their team members reach out and find us and talk through the details. But the reality is it's so much deeper than that. I mean, you, you talk about culture. I, I just interviewed a guy on our podcast yesterday about resilience. Oh, before we forget, and the name yeah. of your podcast is? It's the Catalyst Health and Wellness Coaching Podcast, and it's focused on evidence-based practices in health and wellness. You and I were talking offline about all the baloney that's out there, all the fads, all the headline chasing, and, and we, we resist that as a company, but through the podcast, we wanted to try to say, look, the Catalyst Health and Wellness Coaching Podcast is all about evidence-based. It's not the stupid stuff. It's not the ridiculous things that get your attention, shiny object, but frankly, it's not going to help your life at all. So... Uh, so in any case, I completely lost where I was with that, but I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. That's okay. No, I, this, I, I love getting off the rail. So let's keep doing that. No, what we were uh, talking about is the business owner, how they recognize oh, yeah, the, yeah, the next level. Yeah. So the, the, the medical claims or the sick time are oftentimes what brings them to us initially or makes them think we should probably do something like that. But what makes them happiest long-term is they see the impact it's having just in people's lives. My PhD is on performance psychology. So it's all about how do we improve our performance through a number of different ways. Let me grab some water here. And being properly hydrated is one. Yes. <laughs> and not coughing on the nuts that you just ate. Um, so they'll, they'll notice things like, uh, wow, people are sleeping better. Well, do you know what happens when you sleep better? It doesn't just make you feel like you're less sleepy. It improves your performance in a dramatic way. One of the studies I did for my PhD was on sleep and mental toughness. How does sleep, how does time in bed influence your rating of mental toughness? And then what, how does mental toughness affect everything else? And we found outstanding results. So, you know, just something simple like that. If we only take everything else off the board, we're, we're talking about all these different things, but we just for a moment said, let's address sleep. If we only influence that, that business owner would say, huh, we have better relationships, we have better energy, we have less sick time, we have better financial decisions. I mean, it's just crazy. A, a simple example, you, if, if you didn't sleep well last night, and I, I don't mean chronic sleep deprivation, I don't mean you know, you're going off the rails, this has been going on for you know, two months or something, Bob. I'm talking about 
last night, your likelihood of exercising this morning, even if you normally would, goes down somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 to 40%. And your likelihood, you know, as we're chatting here, it's, it's quarter to two mountain time. And that hunger pang you get at three-ish in the afternoon, your likelihood of choosing junk food instead of something healthy at that three o'clock, 3.30, whatever time people take, goes up on the junk food side dramatically, the same 40%, 50% if you didn't sleep well just last night. So it's those kinds of things that the business owner will notice is, wow, I thought we were addressing medical claims. This has changed our culture. This has made people happier. This has improved their marriages. It's across the board. You know, I, and I think, you know, you don't have to have a membership and you don't need to go buy a set of weights, you know, yeah, yeah. You, know, you know, as you say that I'm struck by, I wonder how many business owners and people recognize that fact. I think what's missing, frankly, is people hear about coaching and they either think of their third grade teacher who had them do push-ups in PE, or they think of the insurance company's coach, and nothing against coaches that work for insurance companies. They do a great job. It's just a different model. And this is all about you. This is how can we make your life better? Fun example, we had a coaching certification out in New Jersey last weekend, and I was sitting in on, we we have mentor coaches come in and I was sitting in on one of the sessions where a a new coach was coaching another coach and and they go back and forth and they started off and, and this gentleman, when, when the first coach said, well, what would you like to talk about? He said, I think I'd like to talk about cats. And I was kind of like, is he joking? Like, what, what do you, what do you mean? Within about four minutes, it wasn't at all about cats. It was about his relationship with his wife and how he is a treasure to him and he wanted to be better and here's what he was going to do to improve. So it's, it, and that's, that's what effective professional coaching does. The, the, the traditional or the old school coaching is, are you eating your fruits and veggies? Did you exercise today? Yes, no, okay, good. That doesn't do any good. Like, that's a waste of everybody's time. But professional, meaningful coaching changes the equation. Because I start off saying, I want to talk about cats. And it turns out, I want to improve my relationship with my wife because I really love her. And I want to make sure that she knows that. So it's those kinds of things that come out with coaching if it's done well. And that's the exciting thing for me. You know, I think about the the business owner back. You know, of course, that's I, I like business owners. So we're sitting here and, and you guys are brought on board. And you go through the entire population of employees with your coaching sessions. Are they one-on-one or one-to-many? No, it's one-on-one. It's, it's a personalized one-on-one setting. It's telephonic, so it's done around their convenience. Um, and that keeps it from being too expensive, too. I mean, it's not cheap. This is, this is not an X and O on a computer screen. This is a person who's scheduling time out for you who's highly credit, credentialed. But when you do it right, it doesn't have to be that expensive either. It, and so, so you, you've got that and I'm, I'm the employer and we've set up and all my employees have gone through one time through. Mm-hmm. So is it a one and done or is there follow ons or how does that Good work? Question. So it, different models for different companies, budget often is the driver for that. Mm-hmm. So a company that our, our most common model is quarterly. So they have a pre-scheduled quarterly coaching session to keep the ball rolling. They reach out to them via email in between that, that can create a lot of emails back and forth if they got questions. Um, we have companies that do a lot more than that. We have companies that come in saying, Oh, Brad, we love this concept. Like this makes so much sense, but we've already budgeted for next year. Is there any way we could get in at a a smaller level? And so those companies oftentimes will just do two sessions a year Mm -hmm. and they'll do one early in the year. You're just coming out of new year's resolutions. You've got some ideas. Maybe you've done some biometric screenings or something and you have that conversation and then you're going to follow up that neck, that same coach, very important six months later. Now, that's not optimal. It's twice a year. We're not changing the world with twice a year. But wow, compared to what most people have, most people don't have that at all. Mm-hmm. They, they just go through their life. They're just grinding it out. They're just trying to survive. And suddenly they have this conversation with the coach and they say, you know, I never thought about that. Yeah, I actually. And then the coach doesn't just take, oh, that's a good idea and say, oh, I'm glad you're going to work out three times a week. They'll say, well, like when? Oh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Well, what are you currently doing Monday, Wednesday, and Friday? Oh, well, Monday morning before we're, oh, wait, I have to drive my kid to school on Monday. I guess I can't do it Monday. And so they talk all that stuff through. So it goes from being this concept to being reality. And when it becomes reality, 
that's when the, that's when the exciting things happen. And I think that's the problem with New Year's resolutions is people have these great, grandiose ideas while they're on vacation between Christmas and New Year's. Mm -hmm. They've got extra time. They're sleeping in. They're loving time with their family, hopefully. Uh, but regardless, they've got this extra time. They forget that they're working 10 hour days. They drive an hour each way. So that's 12 hours. Then they got to get their kids to soccer. And so it's just the, the reality, the coach brings reality and they say, awesome. I love it that that's a goal. Now, what does that really look like? Not for Joe out here in the clouds, but for Bob in this next month with your current schedule. It's a how to do, not just, you know, you hear, you should get in shape and you go, thank you for that. Exactly. I should be taller, you right. know, well, and it's not even a you should, because one of the keys to coaching is the coach never tells the client what to do. It's really cool, because if I, I, I could tell you what to do, you could tell me what to do. And we would both nod, and we'd be friendly, and we'd smile at each other, and we'd wave and go, thank you very much. That's great advice. And as soon as we leave the room, you go off doing what you were doing, I go off doing what I was doing. Yep. So coaching is never telling. Coaching is always drawing out, well, Bob, what, what, were you, what were you thinking you'd like to do? Oh, I've really been wanting to work on this. Okay, well... What kind of ways have you been thinking about doing that? Well, I, I, I actually, I haven't really thought about it before. So, so it's taking it from, I know the right answer for your life. No, I don't. It doesn't matter how many PhDs I have. I don't know the right answer for your life ever. But you do. And oftentimes you don't have that conversation with somebody to actually draw that out and create that meaningful step that'll frankly change your life for the better. Do, do you think there's a pushback on, on coaching? No, that well, yeah, initially because they don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. But when some and, and, and generically, is there ever one percent, five percent of people saying, I don't like this? Absolutely, we are <laughs> not the perfect thing for everybody, so I won't pretend that. But lion's share 90 percent, 92 percent in our surveys of people who participate in the coaching say things like, I had no idea what this was, and now I won't miss my coaching call for the world. I, we, we had a lady say, we were doing a, a live event with one of our clients and, and she said, she was standing up front kind of sharing her story. And she said, through everything that I had going on last year, all the, the stuff, she said, there were two people that I knew were in my corner. One was my husband and one was my wellness coach. And it was just, I mean, that's the relationship that you create. With mm -hmm. So f for you guys, how long have you been, you've been doing the performance athletics side of the house all your life near as I can tell. No, I'm a late comer. Uh, I, oh. I ran a little bit. I ran a little bit in college. Nobody knew I was there cause I was so slow and I get hurt all the time. Um, I enjoyed basketball, tennis, that kind of stuff, but I really started picking it up in my forties and, uh, fell in love with the endurance sports. And so now I've done, I don't know, probably 60 triathlons, 11 Ironmans, four times at the world championship in Hawaii. Uh, Jerry Schemmel and I did the race across America bike race. We won that a few years ago. Um, so yeah, I've really, I've enjoyed it and it's been a nice combination with this business, frankly, because it allows me to, to have a, a different, a different place to share this information than just the typical, you know, thinking about the concepts and practices and disciplines that you've learned as doing endurance sports, mm -hmm. how do you bring that into the business of, of coaching that you have? What difference did that make in your coaching efforts? In my coaching efforts or more in the, the leadership role? I, I am not. Leadership role? Okay. I, I would say it's really similar, really similar. For example, if you, it, when you think of training for a triathlon, you think of swim, bike, run. That's a small part of it. If you're not eating well, if you're not sleeping, if you're not recovering from those workouts, if you're not fueling appropriately, it's not going to matter. So that type of concept as a, as a CEO, as a business owner, if you're not, you know, Stephen Covey's old sharpen the saw, if you're not sharpening the saw, you're not going to be as effective as you could be. The data is so clear. If you're not doing those things, you will not be the potential person that you could be. It's incredible. So I think that's where that comes in is all the, we, we, as CEOs, as business owners, we have all these things that are on our plate that we're supposed to be focused on. And as a triathlete, you have these three things. I'm supposed to swim. I'm supposed to bike. I'm supposed to run. And if you just focus on those, you'll do okay. If you realize all the complementary aspects to it, you could be awesome. You know, it, it, I, the part that always strikes me 
is professional athletes have at least one coach and many of them have multiple coaches. And yet in the civilian world, non-athletic world, it's, it's not common for an individual to have a coach, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and I, I think about trying to frame and figure out on your own, particularly if you're not a, an avid reader, fairly difficult to take and get that done. It is. And even if you are an avid reader, taking that to what it means for you is it's tough to do. And the, the, the value of that coaching is they help you process. Uh, again, if you look at the research on resilience, it's all about high challenge, high support. If you have low challenge, high support, you don't build resilience. If you have high challenge, no support or low support, you don't build resilience. The key is you want that high challenge. Well, all of the people listening to your show have the high challenge. Do you have the support? Do you have that coach that can help you figure out the sleep, the eat, the scheduling, the how do I keep moving? How do I keep from gaining that 40 pounds? All those kinds of things. We, we think they're subtle. They are immense. They're so important. You'll be such a more effective CEO, business owner, dad, wife, husband, mom, et cetera, if you're taking care of those other things. Are, are you seeing a recognition in, in the coaching space by business owners um, where there are more business owners bringing your coaching into the workplace? What we're seeing is, is they've historically said, oh, we have that through our insurance company. And, and they do. It's a different model, like I said. Uh, but they're finding that when you bring in accredited, so they've gone through the National Board Certification Training Process, confidential, it's not part of the employer, it's not part of the insurance company. It's just, it's just you and the coach. That's it. There's no, there's nobody else in this room. And then that it's meaningful that we're not telling you to do something. We're not jamming something down your throat. We're not telling you about kale and running shoes and all this kind of stuff. We're taking it to you. That's where the power is. And so once they see that, they say, hmm. <laughs> good deal. You know, I, I, I wonder, and you see it when we do podcasts, we talked about it before, where you're actually listening to your guest. And I wonder when the coach is actually listening to their client, how many times the client's been listened to without some preconceived agenda. Bob, you nailed it. That's exactly it. We, 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 usually when we talk to somebody, they're waiting for space to fill as soon as you stop talking. And a coach is all about reflecting back what you just said and what does that really mean and what will that lead to and and why do you want that to be different so you're right so for you you know we were going to try we've sort of gone off the rail on the script anyways which seems to be more of a, of a more recent of you know occurrence but you know for you what are the influences that have led you down this path or books that you've read that are influential for you you know, one I've just recently read, we, we interviewed David Epstein on the podcast uh, about a month ago, and he wrote a book titled Range. I don't know if you remember David Epstein. He was the science writer for Sports Illustrated. He went on to write The Sports Gene. And then his, this new book is titled Range, R-A-N-G-E. And it's outstanding. And it's, it's basically the, and he and, he, he and uh, oh, who's the 10,000 hour writer? Um, and the guy Malcolm Gladwell, Malcolm yeah, Gladwell, Gladwell. They're, they're buddies. Uh, but it's almost like he's coming at it from the other angle. He's saying, instead of specializing, the more range you can have, the more value there is. And he said, the specialist out of the gate will get ahead. So for example, the kid that learns how to dribble at age three is going to get, is, is going to be ahead of their friends in kindergarten, but everybody learns to dribble. So, so the head start doesn't matter when you're a sophomore in high school and you're actually trying to make the college team. So he talks those kind of examples through and, and just, it resonated for me because I just, I have so many different things, you know, creating a triathlon training device invention and doing this PhD that seems people are like, what you're doing, what, why you're 53 years old, why are you doing this thing? Uh, starting our coaching business, doing the U.S. corporate wellness. There is just all these different things. And I enjoy those. But I've always wondered, should I put all that energy into one instead of doing all these things? And so it was probably an affirming book for me to say, okay, you're not totally crazy, Brad. This is working out fine. You know, it's, it's funny. I think I was talking to an NFL agent and they said one of the hallmarks of a successful NFL player is they didn't just play football. Yeah. 
they played baseball, they played hockey, they played foot, you know, something else right. beside, and yeah. they had multiple disciplines that they brought to the table. And it also lengthened their time in the league yep. because they had the multiple discipline. So yep. for you looking back over time and you, there might've been a challenge, you know, I've got here is some failure. There we go. So you can't use the F word. I've got plenty of those. So, you know, when, when you look at the failures, and you bring them forward to where it was a contributing or a positive event. How did you use past failure to get you where you are now? I have so many examples. We could do a whole show on this, my friend. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm convinced that faith is a big thing for me. And I'm convinced that uh, you, you run down this path and you, you hit a wall and you're just like, why that, that, that God, why are you doing this? What is going on here? And then a year later, two years later, five years later, you go, Oh, and, and, and I would almost be willing to say, and I think clearly there's some diseases that people go through that I've been fortunate not to, not to have to battle that would be the exception, and maybe even some of those, that almost every great thing in your life comes on the heels of something where you go, why? And I, so for me, the first example that comes to mind is we wouldn't even be doing what we're doing had I not been laid off from our company when they sold their division to another company and they laid off 27 vice presidents, I was one of them. I was stunned. I'm doing management training and leadership training around the country. I'm overseeing three states, 43 clinics. It's going well, but there was overlap and there was overlap with 27 of us. And so I had this, I, I didn't know what to do. I remember coming home and just looking at my wife, like we have a nice severance package, so we're going to be okay for a little while, but I don't know what to do. Like, this is what I, th I thought you come to work, you work your tail off, you're successful and it just takes care of itself. And that was not the case. 28 days later, we launched us corporate wellness that led to the catalyst coaching Institute. It's been the best 13 years of my life. No question. Like I don't even have to pause. I don't have to think, was that better than the last? No, this was amazing. That never would have happened had that, I would say failure not occurred in 2007. So yeah. And that's one of many, 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 many examples. You know, I, I think about, you know, the old cliche thing is you don't, you don't grow in your comfort zone. No, you, you grow outside your comfort zone. Yeah. And, you know, I think all of us get pressurized periodically. And, and then I think that's where character is defined. Mm -hmm. You know, it was in those pressure moments. Are you going to fall down? Or are you going to get up and do, yeah, you know, and for you, you know, I, I was, we talked about this a little bit before the show too. Um, you know, when you, when you go into the triathlon uh, arena or whether you're going to ride across the country and there's no doubt in your mind what's coming because you've done the bicycling, you've done the running, you've done the swimming and you kind of go, I, you know, I excel at this and I'm the less good at that. How do you take and get your mind set up for the challenge that you know is coming? I enjoy the competitive side of things. So this would not work for everyone, but I tend to put a huge goal out there. So for example, one of my goals after this PhD is done is to make the podium at Kona. Kona is the world championship. So that means be one of the top three 55 year olds in the world um, at the Ironman world championship. And so setting that massive goal drives the training to such an extent that I know I'm the most prepared person out there. Now I might get a flat tire. I might have a stomach issue. I might, yeah, whatever, have a knee issue. It doesn't matter. Things happen. They happen to everybody. And that may happen. But I know that if I can pull off my training, I'll win that race. And I think a lot of that is maybe it's, maybe it's the training phase builds that confidence going in. And maybe it's the, um, if I do this well, I can win this thing. And just knowing that, and usually it's an unrealistic thing. I'll usually, I've got a buddy of mine. I'm not going to say his name, but awesome guy. One of the best triathletes in the state. Everybody loves him and, and incredibly talented. And I've never beat him, but I still think I can still think I can. It's, hope. And so, <laughs> it's not just hope. It's a driver. So uh -huh. he's one, one race. He beat me. And this is kind of a funny story. He beat me. I had the faster swim bike run, but he was so good in transitions that he beat me overall by a few seconds. We had another one that I, he beat me on the swim. I got him on the bike, which he usually does get, get me. And then I couldn't quite get him on the run, but it, that belief is still there. And I think the belief drives the training 
which then drives the belief. So it's this cyclical type thing. Do, do you, do you employ uh, triathlete coaches to help you out? On and off. I, most of it's myself. So my background, physical therapist, uh, again, get a PhD in psychology. Uh, I study everything about wellness, obviously because of my role, but it does help. I've worked with, um, three different coaches. They've all been outstanding. And I, I think when I get to that, I, I can get the first 95%. I need that coach to give me that last 5%. Mm -hmm. So if, if I'm going into a race saying, okay, I want to try to qualify for Kona as long as I stay healthy, that should happen. I can do that on my own, work around my own schedule. When it's time to try to nail a coffin on that Kona podium spot, I'm going to need help for that. You know, for, for the swinging back to the corporate wellness side, you know, if you could take and put an ad or a banner on the front page of, of any business paper talking about the key takeaways from doing a wellness program, what would they be? Key takeaways. I think if I were creating a headline, it would be something like, are you doing this one key thing or this one critical thing or something along those lines? Because I think when people think wellness, they think of all the extraneous stuff. They think of, oh, we need to do health risk assessment. Oh, we need to do biometric screenings. Oh, we need to have the web portal set up. Oh, we need to have points for this and this and this and this. And those are all good things. And we do all those things. And we have partners that do those things very well as, on top of that. But when it comes down to it, wellness is personal. And if we're not doing meaningful, accredited, personalized, confidential coaching, then we're missing the boat. We're just missing it. So I think that would be the key is there's all these things with wellness. You're being told all these different things, but are you doing the one that will move the dial the most? Wellness is about behavior change. If it were just about information, we could just send people to Google websites. You know, as you focus in on, on the discussion face-to-face, -face, you know, and, and that person, you can see the switch when they go from, I don't know about this, to comfort. What do you think that light switch is for those folks? And you're not talking comfort zone there. You're talking, I, I kind of like talking to my coach. Yes. And, and the question is, what, what is the... What do you think the trigger point is for the client that causes them to shift? You know, I, it's obviously different for each person. I think the biggest single one is a realization that they're not going to be told what to do. None of us like to be told what to do. And so when we have an appointment with a, a wellness coach we think they're going to tell us to eat kale and start running. And we don't, at least a good coach doesn't. And so when the person realizes, oh my word, this is about me and what I want to improve in my life. Like who doesn't want a better life? Mm -hmm. I don't know anyone that doesn't want their tomorrow to be a little better than today. And that's what wellness coaching is. So the person that realizes when that, that switch flips over and they say, oh, I'm not going to get lectured for 20 minutes or an hour or 30 minutes or whatever. I'm going to get a better life by talking about me. Like how cool is that? You know, you know for the, for the corporate clients that bring you guys on board and let's say I'm that corporate client and I brought you on board a couple of years ago and you said, we really like the outcome and we've maintained a program. What do you see as, as far as the change in the company when you get you know, one, two or three years past your first mm -hmm. sessions? Yeah, you'll tend to see the medical claims level out because you're, you're taking care of a lot of those low hanging fruit type aspects. You're starting to change life patterns within three years. So it's not just we're trying to lose five pounds. Oh, that's cool, but it doesn't really make a difference. You're starting to see some real life changes. Mm -hmm. So you, you do see that, but you, it's also some of the culture things we talked about earlier you tend to see less turnover. You tend to see less sick time. You tend to see greater engagement at work. Again, simple sleep. If we're improving the sleep of people, that enhances everything. Uh, people complain about stress all the time. Stress is a big, big topic of conversation right now. And, and I think one of the reasons, yes, there's stress in our lives. There's stress in all of our lives. But I think in a lot of ways, we can't handle as much stress as we used to because we're carrying around 50 extra pounds. So everything's more tiring. We're not sleeping enough. We're on our phones constantly. We're not eating well. We're drinking too much. We're having caffeine all hours of the day. Well, of course I can't handle stress if that's my life. So if we can start chipping away, we're not going to come in and say no more coffee, spinach at lunch every day. You know, we're not going to do that. But if the employees start looking for ways to improve their lives and realize, wow, 
So if I start sleeping better, that's going to improve how much I make, my relationship at home, my discipline with exercise, whatever is important to them. That's pretty powerful. And so they start sleeping better and then it influences everything else. So for the person who goes, okay, cool. How do I sleep better? What do you advise to sleep better? So we don't start with advising. It's coming back to the coaching again. We talk about, oh, I don't know. What do you mean by not sleeping well? What does that look like, Bob? And and if you want to play this out, I'm totally happy to do that too. Because, you know, for a lot of times, like I was on a recent episode, the guy said, you should have good financials. Uh They go like, okay. Right. What does that that mean? Right. Yeah. What does that look like? What, you know, and if I had them, what do I do with them? Right. So we would start off talking about what, what is your sleep now? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you know, I tend to, and a lot of times just that conversation makes a difference. I was talking to a gentleman, I can't remember how long ago this was, but he started telling me about his sleep pattern. He said, no, I sleep pretty good. And I said, just play with me here. What, what, what does it look like? He said, well, you know, I usually go to bed. I I get about eight hours. He said, I usually go up to bed about 11 and then, you know, I'm I'm ready. I'm pretty much in bed by 1130 and I usually get, I'm up by six ish probably most of the time. And I just started laughing. I said, uh, I'm not sure how you get eight hours in there, but it's pretty impressive. I want to do that. So he laughed. And then he's like, oh, that's true. And within a month, he was, going, he was starting to go up at 1030 now. Instead of going up at 11, he was capturing that extra half hour. And he noticed the difference. He, no, he literally said, I can feel the difference. Just a half hour, half hour. So it's those kinds of conversations that sometimes we think we're fine. We like to use that word in this country. Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. I know you're fine, but are you happy with fine? Fine in our family is a a, a bad word. It's a four letter word. If our kids say I'm fine, I'll I'll literally, and now it's a joke. So we laugh about it. But I would, when they were growing up, how how you doing, Josh? I'm fine. Oh no. Did you break your leg today at school? You know, it's just fine. Is fine good enough? Is fine the life you want to live or is great the life you want to live? And that's the decision. And once you decide, because if you're fine with fine, like my, my PhD research is on mental toughness. If you're fine with fine, you don't need me. That, you, can, you can be fine on your own. You can just meander your way through, grind it out, barely get through the day, make the minimal income you can, you know, carry all this extra weight around, don't sleep well, have a very average relationship with your wife and kids. If that's fine with you, go for it. Knock yourself out. But if you want better, there's a lot of ways to get better. You know, as you were talking about your PhD on mental toughness, you know, and I think about mental toughness and for many of the folks, they're going to be in the corporate arena way longer than any athlete, 30, 40, 50 years. They're going to be in there. And I, I think about the ability to come in and coach the senior corporate athlete, for lack of a better term. What are you seeing in that crowd? The same things at a different age. So they're wanting the best life they can have and they're not sure how to get there. And if anything, they, and I should say me too, I'm, I'm kind of entering that mid fifties now. Um, I'm more stuck in my habits. And so it, it can be more difficult to move past. So I think that's one of the values of the research I've had an opportunity to do is it brings the idea. Cause a lot of times people see mental toughness as something you use on the football field. Come on, I know your leg's broken, but get back out there. We need you on the field. And so that's what we think of with mental toughness. And that's not mental toughness. Mental toughness is an ability to achieve above your trend line. So if you think Google's got an algorithm on you, we got it on all of us. Do you want to perform at that algorithm? Or what if you could perform just a little bit above it? When I do speaking keynotes and stuff, uh, two of the examples I use is the icing on the cake. Icing on mental toughness, is icing on the cake. It's not the cake. If you don't make the cake, I can't help you. Mm-hmm. But if you have the cake, we can make this a really cool design with some great icing or a sentence. You don't need to put an exclamation point at the end of a sentence. You can just put a period there. That's totally fine. If you like living your life just with periods, then live your life with periods. You don't need to use mental toughness. But if you'd like to put an exclamation mark every once in a while, we got one for you. And so that's where that comes in. And so with the senior executive leadership, they hear that and they say, I think I would like a little bit more. I do have this. And, and you don't use mental toughness 24-7. You use it strategically. You say, I want to 
run this marathon. I want to be better speaking in front of a crowd. I want to, you know, whatever it is, and you use it strategically in those situations. And this allows them to have the tools to do that basically. You know, for, for all of that, I think, you know, like for me, people say, what's your biggest fear is, is I fail to live up to my potential. And of course, when you achieve this goal, of course, what's next? Well, whatever the next one is, mm -hmm. this is what I'm interested in, you know, and it, it makes one show up daily, at least it makes me show up daily. So for you, you know, looking back, when, when you allocate your day and you've got the PhD, you'd finished your PhD dissertation, didn't you, or defense? I'm working on it now. Defense is late October, theoretically. Okay. We, we should be done by the end of the year. You know, so you've got that going on. You've got your businesses going on. What's, what's the allocation of your time or a habit that you use to manage all of that? I am hyper-focused. So, you know, if you joke, our daughter's a fourth grade teacher. We joke about that's her superpower. She's a teacher. and It's amazing. I think mine would be hyper-focused. So right now I'm in the tail end of writing up the dissertation. I am hyper-focused on that. And so when I get up in the morning, if it's 4.30 or 5 in the morning, once that workout's done, I am all in and I just go until 6 at night and then I cut it off wherever I am and, and we move forward. So I think that helps me. I, I, people, and I'm sure they ask a lot of your, your viewers the same question because they're all high achievers. People are constantly like, how is it possible that you can train for an Ironman, run a business, hopefully be a good dad, good husband, all these other things at the same time, like those don't fit. And uh, some of it's time management, but a lot of it's just, you know what you want to achieve and you just dial it up and get after it. You know, I think about that in, in, in this business that I'm in past the podcast space, it's extremely important to be focused on what you're doing and tune out the noise. And, and we all have rituals, at least I do. And I'm assuming many do. When, when you're in, in the midst of focus, something will happen and you go, I'm not as focused as I want to be. What do you do to reset and get back into focus? Depends on what it is. Um, and it depends on what I'm hyper-focused on. I may need to pull that distraction. I may, may need to step out. Um, I've also got little things that I'll do throughout the day. Uh, for example, somewhere around 2.30 every day, 3 o'clock, I have the same healthy snack. So it's, a, it's one square of 90% dark chocolate and a handful of almonds. So that will give me a break. I'm needing to get a little fuel anyway, but I space it into that because I know that's generally a break between when I grabbed a little salad for lunch and when I'm going to cut it off at six ish uh, for the evening. So things like that um, are, are probably the biggest thing. And then I, I keep coming back to sleep. I feel like it's a sleep podcast instead of a, a mm -hmm. business podcast, but the, the, the sleep aspects, if I'm sleeping well and I don't always sleep well, it's a big issue for me at times, but that allows that hyper focus to tune out the noise even mm -hmm. more than I would otherwise. So when I've sharpened the saw in other areas, when I'm able to get my run in, when I'm able to get the sleep and when I'm eating well, it, that focus is even more. When I'm not doing those things, I'm highly distractible. So I'm all over the place. So usually if I'm getting distracted, it's a sign that something else is going on wrong and I need to deal with that. You know, I, it's recently I found some headphones that I like to put on mm -hmm. and it tunes out the planet. Yep. You know, and I'll put some noise on in the background really low and it yeah. keeps the back end of my mind occupied, yeah. you know, and I find that as a, a reasonable tool to, Absolutely. to assist. Yeah, but, I do um, the same thing. It's a good tool. Yeah. Um, past few years, you know, with the growth and initiatives in your company and putting in the Institute, um, what are the additional beliefs or protocols that you put in place that's allowed those businesses to flourish? I think we've tuned into at a higher level, the value of that coaching. We've always done coaching, but in the last three years, we've looked at that and said, okay, we have the web portals, we have the group challenges, we have the mobile apps, we've got the health risk assessment, all the stuff, but what's really moving the dial, what's really helping people create that behavior change they want is the coaching. And I think as we put our focus more and more and more on that, and then as the industry as a whole has, has really kind of awoken to this importance of credentialed coaches and not just nice people on the phone with a script. Uh, it's, it's kind of merged together and, and, and supported each other very well. 
You know, it's it's funny as I'm I'm saying, listen, go, let's see. So we got credentialed people that actually know what they're doing, as opposed to the other coaches that, that were coaching that didn't know what they're doing and going like, well, one would hope the outcome would be better. Yes. Well, and and really nice people, they just don't have the same training. So it, it, there's nothing against them. It's just they don't have the same training. It, it would be well, I don't know if you're on Twitter, but it, you know, Twitter is very much the same. You have these knuckleheads that are they they. They love to yell on the Twitter feeds. They love to spout their, their stuff. And then you have the people that actually research the information. And hopefully you're listening to the right ones because it's very easy to get drawn into the great stories, the cool pictures of the fakes and forget that these quieter people have actually done the research and have studied this for 20 years and they know what they're talking about. So I think that that's a, a similar, an even broader differential between the people that are really nice people and can carry a conversation and they have a good script and the person who's actually a trained coach. You know, before I forget, Brad, what, how do people find you on social media? So they want to engage and bring you guys on board. Yeah. Email's the easiest. It's B Cooper at us corporate wellness.com. If you're on Twitter, it's at catalyst, the number two, thrive catalyst to thrive and on that site i basically just post a lot of human performance studies references um, tips retweet things that other people i'm following that know what they're talking about even more than i do about nutrition or sleep or exercise or healthy eating or, or any of those kinds of things so catalyst to thrive and b cooper at us corporate wellness.com you know invariably i forget to ask so i thought this time i would make it and, and not forget you know, misconceptions about your role in, in the leadership position with your companies. What do you think the biggest misconception might be? I don't know if there's any conceptions. So I don't know. Do, do you need conceptions before you have misconceptions? I don't know if anybody knows I exist. So it's not a, it's like, huh, what does he do? You know, only half jokingly, I think a misconception, maybe not just about me, but about people in this role as a whole is that we know completely what we're doing. I think every day is a learning process. Every day I make mistakes and every day I try to fix those and I reflect on them and I say, okay, what can be different? I'm looking at my running journals just off to the left of the screen here. And I, I just saw that sitting there and I did the same thing with running. I, I went out and did a track workout yesterday, 12, 200, 12, 400. And it was terrible. Like I was slow. I didn't have it. I couldn't hit the splits I was wanting to hit. And so I came back and I reflected and I thought through, why was that? I, you know, was it fatigue? Was it, was it this? Was it eating? Was it a glass of wine the night before? Was it, what was it? And I think if we do the same thing with our work lives, it's incredibly valuable. If we take that moment and it just, it can just be a moment. It doesn't have to be an hour. It doesn't have to be a half hour, but just reflect on, wow, I just really screwed that meeting up and not just walk away saying, oh, great. I screwed the meeting up what could I have done different? Should I have started off differently? Should I have interacted with people a little bit more before? You know, whatever it might be, but reflect, reflection is a powerful tool. And I think we miss that opportunity in the rush, rush, especially in the roles that we play. You know, I think there's a habit on pre-mortem and post-mortem and the military has that down. They'll have after action reports and they'll have evaluations and training and what we did well and what we didn't do well. And then you go, okay, what, what didn't you do well? And says, what are we going to do now yep. to address shortfall? And I think about in this particular business and probably yours too, you get to know every day where you go, well, that didn't work out quite as well as I'd like. Right. What can I do better or different? And if I'm going to pay the price of tuition, I might as well, I might as well get something out of it. Right. You know, so for, um, you know, influences in, in folks that, you know, perhaps a quote is meaningful for you. What quote's meaningful for you? Yeah, you know, it's really easy to remember. You're familiar with Seth Godin. Uh, great blog for, for your listeners that are not leaving Seth's blog on a daily basis. It's pretty powerful. But he's got one, and I'll simplify it to pick yourself. But the concept of pick yourself, he has a longer uh, post about this and even almost a book on it of everybody's waiting to get picked. They're sending in their resume. They're, if they're a writer, they're sending their book to Oprah to get on Oprah's book list. If they're you know, an athlete, they want to get on this team. And, and Seth is big on pick yourself, jump in, get it going and ship something that matters. That's meaningful. 
and then you pick yourself. And I think that's a powerful reminder to all of us, especially, I, I think it's, again, kind of encouraging the folks that are probably listening to this because they've already picked themselves. They're running their business. They're the CEO. So it's, it's been a good reminder to me of I've screwed up a lot. I've tried to start many businesses. We've only had two and a half that have been successful. And I'm going to keep picking myself. You know, I, I, I think as for, for the business owner, you know, I don't know any business owners didn't have a failure in a business somewhere. <laughs> I mean, none of them. Okay. You know, and you look at that and you go, well, how many business coaches that really know what they're doing are out there to teach you along the way if you weren't fortunate to have a mentor? Right. You got to figure it out kind of as you go. Yep. You know, and in many cases, you get in your own way. Yep. You know, so, yep. you know, Brad, you know, if, if to, to kind of wind it up, and we, we probably touched on this more, but between when you're in an endurance uh, effort or if you're endurance in your business, which is truly a marathon, multi-year deal, sure. when you have less than an optimum outcome, what type of self-talk or self-coaching goes on between your ears when you're reminding yourself, uh, yeah, I really do have five more miles to go or I really have you know, this business challenge? What do you do mentally? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll ponder that with you. But the first thing that comes to mind, it might be of even more interest. My fourth PhD study was actually on self-talk and its influence on mental toughness. And it's not published yet. We've submitted it to the Journal of Applied Sports Psychology. Hope to hear back soon. And if they don't take it, we'll submit it somewhere else. So it should be published in the next, I don't know, two to four months. But the data from that was fascinating. What we did is we took three 800, three athletes, three runners, an Ironman triathlete, an All-American triathlete, and a high school track coach, all masters. So these are all 35 plus. This is not high school kids. It's not pros. This is people living real lives, real stressors, the whole deal. And they ran multiple 800s. So 800 is two laps of the track for the people that aren't runners out there. Two laps of the track. They'd meet me. They'd run as fast as they could. And they go home. Two days later, they come back. They'd run as fast as they could. Two days later, they come back. And we did that for four to six times before we changed anything. So we set the baseline. We got the learning curve out of the way. It wasn't because, Bob, you learned how to run an 800. We got that out of the way. And then on the fifth, sixth, or seventh session, we gave them a personalized self-talk strategy based on some of the conversation we've had, things they brought up to me, et cetera, et cetera. They saw between a 6 and 12% improvement in their time. Now, just to put that in context, caffeine, the most utilized drug on the planet, has an impact of somewhere between 1.9 and 2.6% in your performance. Now, granted, these are not 800-meter specialists. If you took a high school kid that specialized in the 800 and did the same thing, I believe he would still see improvement, not 6%, not 12%. But still, how cool is that? And so it was a reminder that whether you're an 800-meter runner or a business owner, Self-talk is powerful, and we saw it impact not only their times, but also their mental toughness assessment scores. So with, with that kind of in the backdrop, what do I use? I use almost like the study. This was personalized. The one that one person used was different than the next person, next person, and I use different ones for myself, and I even think they can wear out. So mm -hmm. if, if I've got one that's really helpful to me, I'll use that for a while when I'm in need of it, and then I'll need a different one. And so you're needing to pick different ones to go through that. Um, so, yeah, it, it changes every day. Changes what, would, every month. what would be an example? I'm curious. Well, the, the, the simplest one is you got this. Yeah. And it's interesting. A study just came out looking at the difference between I've got this and you've got this. Sounds real subtle, doesn't it? It ain't subtle. The difference is powerful. So using the self-talk, you've got this, even though I'm saying it to myself is better, it's more effective than me saying, I've got this. And there's mm -hmm. something about that support system of it feeling like it's somebody else coming in and saying, Bob, you got this, come on, buddy, you could do this. So uh, that's a simple one that I use all the time. You know, I, I think that would be fascinating if you're going into a business presentation or a board meeting, or you, you know, making a pitch to a really big customer and you take and take a moment before you go in and go, I've done all my homework, just like you're talking about, I've done all my training. Yeah. I had the opportunity to win, you know, and, and I wonder how many people actually think about that as a discipline. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a real good one. Well, Brad, this is fascinating. I can't wait for your research to come out. 
Yeah. And uh, hopefully what would be fun to do is once you're done and you're now Dr. Brad, when you get all completely done, we'll have to circle back around and talk great. about some of the research. But I sincerely appreciate you taking time out of your schedule on a Friday afternoon. And uh, this has been time. a lot of fun. You yeah, bet. Thank you, Bob. Thanks. Thanks very much. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate it. And uh, uh, best of luck with uh, getting your defense done on your PhD. We're getting close. <laughs> it's a long journey. That's Thanks right. so much. All right. Take care. You bet.